Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, so today we are going to chat about uh, augmented. This is going to be the first session in a series of how to's. So this one will not be a, a how to specifically, but it's going to kind of ease us in to that process, which will begin in two weeks. And that will be uh, a, a number of events. We're not exactly sure how many. We'll see how, how quickly or how slowly uh, we cover the material. Um, but I expect it to be between three and six uh, weeks uh, happening again every other Thursday at this time. So a couple other future sessions that are coming up uh, right after this one, uh, as we do every Thursday, is a session presented by Megan and Noah about HOG. So that'll be at one o'clock Eastern time. And then there's a few more on your screen there that you can see. And those are all listed on the EPC study hall page. So you can sign up for any or all of those there. Uh, okay, so first thing I want to do is introduce the folks who are going to be chatting with us today. So we have Lowell Alcott. So he is our Integrative Technologies Marketing Product Manager, uh, which means he has the fun job of making all of our products work with each other. Say hi, Lowell. There he is. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, and so under his purview is Augmented. Um, so it's a little bit interesting. So our next person is Ann Valentino, who is our EOS marketing product manager. So even though Augmented is uh, obviously integrated very much into EOS, uh, we have two product managers kind of working in tandem on this product. So we'll get both of their opinions on all this as we go on. And then hopefully a little bit later, if his schedule allows, we will be joined by Matt Halberstadt. So Matt is our technical product manager for uh, our consoles and controls. Um, so Matt can speak a little bit more to the, the nitty gritty development side, hardware, um, those sort of things, if, if you guys have those types of questions. And then also on our panel today are Nick Gonsman and Jason Perry. They are our field project coordinators from uh, the Northeast office. We have David Fox, who you've already met. He'll be serving as our, our host and producer, helping out uh, answering your questions. And I am Rob Crane. I am your field project coordinator in the Southwest. Uh, okay, so we are going to jump right in to uh, our interview and I'm gonna stop sharing the PowerPoint so that you can just see all of our pretty faces this morning, hopefully smiling. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna jump right in. So a lot of these questions will be for you, Lowell and Ann, uh, but anyone else, if you have thoughts, uh, all of us here have been working with the software for a year-ish, some more, some less. Um, so feel free to jump in uh, as we get going. So I will start off by talking about my experience with Augmented and uh, lead into a question. Uh, so we uh, revealed Augmented in uh, Louisville, Kentucky last March at USITT. And I had the, the pleasure of being on the front lines of the, the sales force who's there to talk to people about it, explain it, demo it. And one of the first things that we, we said to people that, that weekend was that it is not a visualizer. We kind of, we kind of led with that. Um, uh, so, so first of all, kind of broad question for you guys, is, is it a visualizer? And if it's not, then what is, what, what is augmented? Jump in and start with that. Uh, so yeah, th that's very much a conversation we've been having a lot. And, and really what it boils down for me is, well, yes, it absolutely does have some visualizer elements. The biggest difference for me is in a visualizer, you spend as much time as possible trying to get that perfect photorealistic representation of what your space is going to be and what it's going to look like. In augmented, we're focusing on certain elements of that but really on making it being a 3D programming tool. And what I mean by that is allowing you to interact with your lights in the 3D space, to grab a set of lights and click the focus on a point instead of having to grab 20 individual things and pan and tilt them all over to the location. Now, you absolutely do need a certain element of visualization to see that, but really what it comes down to is that difference between seeing and representing and trying to get that really fantastic photorealistic representation that you'll get in a true visualizer. Uh, put bluntly, in Visualizer, you get to set the speed of the haze. In Augmented, you get to focus your lights. 
Yeah, the right. focus was also on on like full integration into the workflow of your desk, so that you know that it became our, our our real focus was trying to make this feel like another feature that lived within EOS that expanded your speed and accuracy, and didn't wasn't this thing hanging off to the side as and it also does this. So that's been a lot of our focus, I think, as this has been developing over the past. Years. Yeah, we also found that, you know, visualizers really help you until you get to the stage door. Uh, and then most people discard the visualizer and all the hard work they've done there. Um, we wanted really something that could help from concept to closing night um, along the entire path of, of what you do as technicians and designers. Nick, you had a good way of talking about this earlier. You know, weigh in a little bit. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not going to be as articulate as when we were talking. About <laughs> spot, right? you know, I, I I think that um, you know, uh, oftentimes, uh, certainly in in uh, theater style production, linear playback, those sorts of things, um, we spend a lot of time a lot of time um, trying to get our other creatives uh, on board with our ideas. Lighting is something that we have to do in a space with real fixtures, real humans. And so we use research, we use previs, we use a lot of other tools um, to to show and 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 give our ideas to our other creatives, our directors, our our, our costume designers, to get them on board with something. Um, and and again, this isn't sort of the focus of this tool, right? Uh, someone who needs a lot of detail. Um, in order to get on board with an idea, this may not be the way to to sell them on on that idea, right? And there are other great tools that still do that, like you know, visualizers, capture, um, WYSIWYG, things like that. So um, I don't think that that replaces any of those tools um, for selling an idea, selling design ideas. Um, so yeah. I can't remember, Nick, if it was you or Rob who said when we were chatting the other day about uh, giving you the ability to see past the numbers in the matrix and actually see the blonde from that. Um, so, you know, given that, you know, we we all become masters of data as we're programming and the more you master your data and the more that you are better at, at controlling where it is and, and where it's coming from, the better you are as a programmer. And we really wanted to, to help with that. Um, and we think that this gives you the ability to to take that data past just the numbers and into something that you can see and, and feel and interact with. Yeah, it's kind of like taking an Excel spreadsheet full of numbers and turning it into a chart. Like it's something yeah. like they're <laughs> they're both the same information, but you can you can quickly glance at a graph and understand what's going on without having to like scroll through and squint a lot. Uh, and then I'll just also say I think David said this at the beginning, but. Uh, you guys are welcome to ask questions in the Q&A, and we'll kind of fold those in as as appropriate. So, so far, the uh, the only real so far the only real question that came in was really a comment, um, and it was people who are jealous of Anne's decor because um, they can't all say that they have an EOS just sitting in the background in their house. Well, I, if I could type a response to that, Randy, I would, but I can't. Um, I, you know, I've worked from home forever, so this isn't really much different for me these days. Um, yeah, I have a full suite of consoles here, actually. Thank you should you. also do, Stu, in full disclosure, uh, Anne and David and I all have dogs running around, so if you hear barking, that's what's going on there. Sometimes you need a canine or four in, in every... <laughs> um, yeah, uh, one question that did come that. in. Uh, so augmented is pretty much for creating focus palettes for moving lights, question? So there's definitely an element of that. Yeah, you can do quite a bit with moving lights, but we've added in a lot of power for seeing what your conventionals are doing too. So you know where where they're pointed at this given moment normally isn't changing, but what uh, what their intensity levels are, if they've got some form of, of color or other non-intensity parameter modification on it, being able to add those parts and see all of that. Um, you know, we we don't want this to just be a tool for um, we, we, for moving light programmers, we want to try and make it so you can really visualize and uh, that word. Uh, you can see and experience the the interaction of the world that you're playing with, uh, regardless of what you're working with. James asks, uh, so with it not being a visualizer, um, what does that mean for possibilities of full integration with Vectorworks 
or being able to import scenery um, or, or drafted images from a set designer? Sure, yeah, great question. Um, you know, in order to create the 3D world, you need that information. Um, if you've seen me do a demo or seen any of my Feature of the Weeks, you've heard me say the phrase, all you really need is a floor, but everything else is an advantage. The more you add to your scene, the more bits and pieces of your world you put in there, it's not necessarily just adding to the way it looks, it's adding to the points you can click on, the things you can interact with. Um, one of the things we spent a lot of time working on is this concept of, you know, X and Y is pretty straightforward, but Z, raise, you know, height, uh, is, is really where it gets to be uh, even more interactive and, and more difficult. So being able to have those, those set pieces that raise your Z at, to a higher point is huge. Um, if you click on a chair inside of Augmented, the light is going to focus on that place on the chair you clicked on. So if you click on the seat, it's going to go to the seat. If you click on the, the chair rim, it's going to go to the rim. So the more you add to your space, uh, the better. And we are absolutely allowing you to import from, from Vectorworks. I know you guys had talked about doing some, uh, some classes, um, maybe as part of this series or part of the other series, about dealing with importation. Um, so for those of you that are listening, we'll definitely make sure that those get onto the schedule and you're aware when we're doing them. Yeah, there is a standalone uh, Vectorworks plugin to aid with that, but n natively, I've lost track below how many different file formats. Oh, we're in the mid 40s of different file formats. Uh, you know, we found that things like Collada and uh, OBJs and FBXs uh, are fairly common between both softwares. Um, I've had a huge amount of success with Collada's. And it's the, true that some of those will give you more information than others. So there are recommended formats to use, yeah? Yeah, Collada um, is, we found to be one of the, the most um, full featured uh, formats and it works really nicely. And Vectorworks uh, exports it natively. Uh, we recently added SketchUp import natively, so you can actually just drop the SketchUp file directly in. Uh, those have some slight limitations on um, materials and some of the more advanced things, um, but uh, absolutely doable. A couple other questions came in. Um, oh yeah, here we go. So we got a lot of questions that are that are kind of rolling in here. I'm trying to work work through some of them. Um, one of the questions, the Vectorworks import that you just mentioned, is that working both on Mac and PC for Nomad? Yeah, let me let me talk real fast about how that Vectorworks process works um, from a very high level. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty uh, nitty gritty details because we'll be doing those in future classes. But basically, there's two sides of Vectorworks. Um, and in that, it's uh, you're going to import your scenic model and you're going to import your lighting fixtures. Scenic models, uh, you export it from Vectorworks, bring it in. That was the DAE Colada FBX that we were just talking about. Uh, and then the plugin that Ann mentioned uh, is for bringing the fixture positions and types directly in. Uh, right now, that is in beta for PC, and we will be uh, bringing that uh, to Mac as soon as possible. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that all in, in the training and workflow and stuff that we'll be doing in later classes. So right. yeah, there's a lot let of, Rob ask some questions here. Just okay. to wrap that up before we move on, there is a lot of information available on the open beta forum about the technicalities of the import, how one goes about importing, what is supported, what isn't supported. So, and that's available for anyone to sign up to. So in between now and when Rob and Lowell do the first training session in two weeks, um, that information is there, is there if anyone wants to like dive into the week on that. And I think a lot of that was also included, Lowell, in your Augmented for Educators, right? You kind of went through how to how to download the beta, how to yep. Absolutely. install it and everything. So that video is called Augmented for Educators and it's on our Study Hall YouTube channel. So that would also be a great place to, to start. Uh, Rob, so, do you with more questions or do you want to do you want to take us in no, a direction? Yeah, I'll take, I'll go with our, our next one here. Um, so, Anne and Lowell, uh, so EOS consoles are, are used in a lot of different venues all over the world. Um, we see them on Broadway and high schools, opera houses, amusement parks, like, and to name a few. Um, so it's, and these desks are used by lighting designers and programmers, of course, uh, but they're also used by stage managers, follow spot ops, uh, and other folks who are adjacent to, to team lighting. Uh, so how how do you foresee, and I, I, I know your answer is gonna be, well, we're gonna wait and see, but how, how do you foresee uh, everybody, like this different array of users 
incorporating augmented into their workflows or or not? You know, it was um, I'm sort of low hat. I I kind of equate this, and I could be wrong. Um, it's early days yet to the way Magic Sheets were dealt with by our you know user base. Um, there were many people who didn't see the need for Magic Sheets and just swore they would never use them. This was not a tool that would provide any value for the amount of time that would go into dealing with them. And then what we we found were people were like, well, let me put in my site system so that I can watch effects running across it. Oh, that actually works pretty well. And then, okay, let me do something with my blue, you know, my blue system so I can see that. And now we are in the world we were in the Magic Sheet today, which is no one does a show without many, many of them. I kind of, I, again, I could be wrong. It, it feels to me like augmented is going to be the same way or could be that you'll, you'll find the people who go full board into it because they're used to working with something like this and they instinctively understand it and they have the time to deal with it. And then the people that will be, oh, let me try this with my moving light rig or, you know, this. And, okay, that was actually worth the time and it did process up so I'll go the next step. I could be wrong. No, I completely agree. Um, you know, the, the amount of people that I've seen jumping in and, and playing with it um, already has been hugely uh, exciting. And yeah, I mean, we'll uh, we'll see how people start working with their uh, their workflows. I think you know we'll, we'll definitely see moving lights programmers jump in a little bit faster than conventional programmers. But the amount of of work you can do in blind or uh, or before being in the space is is huge. Do you think designers uh, versus programmers will use this in different ways? You know, before we uh, we debuted this at USICT, we uh, a couple of us were in London talking with a bunch of people, so we had sort of this designer session and this programmer session, um, and it was interesting watching the different reactions. I think that the designers are a little bit more interested in, in seeing the uh, the visual representation where the programmers are definitely more excited about interacting with it, using it as a tool. Again, very similar to how we see people using Magic Sheets. Um, I think that this is definitely a programmer tool, uh, and we'll see how uh, that continues um, with with integrating into the designer world like Magic Sheet has. But you know, we're, we're we're trying to make this as a tool that helps your workflow and enhances your speed to program. David, any any questions from the crowd, or should we move forward? Sorry, I was in the middle of answering a question. Uh, we've had a couple of questions that have come in about um, some technical specific issues about imports from different different pieces of software um, that I know we're going to probably answer um, privately or or inside of the chat. Uh, but but there have been a couple of other questions that have come up about augmented as um, use as an offline tool. Um, is that something that you anticipate people using quite a bit? Um, yeah. Should they should they treat it? You know, one of the, the biggest questions is: Is there a way to use augmented to build queues in blind and then export to live, similar to other console platforms? You don't really export to live, but one of the things that that um, augmented adds is blind visualization, which is which is completely new because it, in prior to 3.0, if you had a visualizer, it could snoop on the DMX output and, you know, show you what was happening, but there was no facility to be able to go into blind and see what a cue or an effect would do. Um, augmented actually does add that. So you can do all of your work in blind and then cut the cue on stage, just like you would with any other blind content. There's also a new tool that came from a discussion about blind. It's called staging mode. And one of the challenges that you run into is in on an EOS, everything that you do in blind is automatically stored. And the requirement that came up was it would be great if you could go into blind and sort of have scratch pad so that you could do some things, decide what you wanted or didn't want it want before you committed it to the show file. So we're retasking the scroll lock button. So new keycaps, tech services love those. Uh, in 3.0, um, that will become a staging mode key. And when you go into that mode, then you're looking at things, and let's just use the blind example, you're look, you, you can make changes in blind, see what the visualizer, you know, the 3D screen does, and then decide whether you want to commit it to your blind content or not. Um, the same thing can work in live then if you want to queue up a series of changes 
say you have to put a podium downstage, you know, light on a podium downstage center in blue, you could kick the desk into staging mode, um, make those changes, kill the intensity, go out of staging mode, the light will go where, or leave intensity on for that matter. Um, and you can also use a sneak time so that when you're leaving staging mode, you can copy it into live over time. So I think those are things that um, will be an advantage. And the cool thing, and it, I, it doesn't, I can't, never mind, I'm not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just want to back up a little bit to the question about offline. Um, as Ann mentioned, this is a fully integrated part of EOS. So if you are on Nomad in offline without a dongle and you open up your Nomad as usual, tab 38 is augmented. It is just like opening at any other view inside of EOS. You know, there's no need for a standalone option. We do have some standalone options that you can play with if you, if you want to uh, have that. And that's mostly because of, of processing and graphics abilities. You know, we designed these consoles not to be the world's most advanced graphics machines. Um, it's just not their initial function. You know, you can go out there and you can buy a gaming machine uh, that has massively more powerful graphics engine than anything that our, our consoles will have. So we wanted to give you the abilities to still have, have access to that. But yeah, it is it is natively in there. There is nothing you need to do to hook up your addresses or anything like that. It's it's just ready to go. And that can all be used in the offline editor without a dongle. So if you have a dongle, that'll allow you to output to a rig, um, but you don't need that just to work in augmented. More questions or are you... Uh, why don't we why don't we talk about so the next one I had prepared was uh, just talk about the origin a little bit. Um, and actually, I see before I go into that, I see a lot of questions about uh, there was one about staging mode. Uh, so over the next uh, the course of this series, we'll be diving into all these things specifically on how you know this is the syntax to make this work. Um, today we just want to kind of kind of wet your whistle and explain the the why of why we created this product and then over the next few weeks we will uh, go into the how and really show you guys how to how to make it how to make it sing um so can y'all talk about who ca who came up with this idea of augmented um how did they envision it and what has changed since the since the initial vision and it's still changing <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I remember that far back. Uh, well, Anne, you want to talk a little bit about the original EOS concepts? Yeah, this was a little known thing. Um, well, we can talk about his coming on board, but you know, EOS, Dennis Barry and I started specifying EOS uh, beginning kind of 20 or 2002. And at the time, we were just writing up like a perspective on what we wanted the test to be. There was no syntax associated with it, like patch will work like this or whatever, but it was just, here's what we want the control console that we're gonna to design to be able to accomplish. And a key component in that was integral visualization. And we, you know, we kept meeting and we kept doing this document. And what we found was we were spending all of our time talking about that. And at some point we sort of both realized the first thing we needed to do was make a solid lighting control console. That a visualizer isn't a desk. It is a tool in a desk. And if we allowed ourselves to get sidetracked with this kind of concept, I mean, this was almost 20 years ago, right? We'll, we're going to bypass the core functionality that we need to make a really solid lighting control system. So we sort of scrapped all of it and we just put it on the back burner and said, we'll get to it at a later date. And then we focused on you know, what became EOS 1.0 and then beyond. And then Fred, in his inimitable way of always nudging us, um, a few years ago was like, and now it's time to, to, to do this. It's, it's time. And so then that kind of kicked the conversation off again, and then Lowell came. <laughs> I think and then just, just happened. to clarify for, for folks who don't know, uh, Fred Foster was the founder of ETC, if anybody is not aware of that. Yeah, Fred put us all or a bunch of us in a room and, and basically explained that it was time for us to look at it again. And the sort of grandiose vision he had of uh, everything in our world uh, is integrating together. And he looked at me and he went, okay, so we can do this, right? I went, uh, sure, let's have some conversations and figure it out. 
Um, and, you know, we, throughout the, the evolution, there were many, many ideas thrown around and some we've, we've realized and some we haven't gotten to quite yet. There was a question in the chat about um, ways to integrate EOS and Prodigy and the other ATC rigging solutions to know exactly where your, your bar point is. That, that is, was actually one of Fred's big ones. He wanted to be able to have a piece of scenery go across the stage and have a moving light follow it, um, which is something that we are absolutely working towards, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what's next in uh, uh, in augmented um, at, at the end of this, I think. And you know, in, input from rigging systems, from uh, automation systems, is very much on our to very high on our to-do list. Um, but yeah, Fred threw a whole bunch of ideas out, and we we kind of took a look at, at what we could do and and built it together. And we are by no means all the way through his list, and I don't know if we'll ever be all the way through his list, but. Uh, uh, we're really proud of, of what we were able to put forth for, for him and, and where we are now. So, you know, one of the things that I've said a lot in, in conversations like this is the first step for us is to build this 3D world. And once we build this 3D world, there are all sorts of things that we could add to it. Someone was asking about uh, VR and, and other uh, hardware for collaborative meetings and stuff like that. You know, it's absolutely possible in the future. We had to take the first steps into this 3D virtual world, and now we continue adding pieces and modules um, and integration points as we go. Um, but we're taking this really big, awesome step now. Which is, I guess, a little bit of a cautionary tale to anybody who's looking at ES 3.0 software. No feature is ever finished at first release, right? <laughs> and so a little expectation management. This is a massively big project to get where we are today from where we were not very long ago. Um, so, and we're focusing on the key things that will speed up the programming process and help facilitate show transfers when you are, have a show that's gonna go on tour. Um, features that will help speed that up for programmers. Um, and then, as well said, the, the list of things once we get that sort of core set in goes on for a long time. And you know, with a feature like this, so much of it's shaped by our users, right? We have ideas about things and then we put it in the market. And all of the ideas begin to come back from you guys, and that really does impact the direction of any feature development. And we had a conversation earlier this week about something that we thought was firm. We thought we had it exactly how we wanted it, and somebody on, on the, uh, the beta group commented about, well, have you thought about it this way? And it just totally 180 the entire thought process, and we had to make the decision about whether we were going to make that change now or, or in the future. It's, it's always tricky. You know, none of us try to make decisions in a vacuum. We, we love talking with, with people like yourselves who are listening to this. Um, and we thank you for your input and, and your feedback. And oh my God, it's the beta forum been active right now. Uh, what, uh, I, I, Anne was joking the other day and I completely agree that I can't wait for beta to be over so my email stops dinging as much as it does. But we, we so appreciate that. Um, and and the, the feedback we've gotten from you is, is fantastic. <laughs> David, are there any, any questions come in we should look at right now? Yeah, I think there's an interesting one that kind of touches back on something, Anne, you were just talking about when you were working with Dennis. Um, can you talk about how the processes and, uh, and emphasis uh, informed what we wanted to do and what we ultimately are doing now with Augmented? Do you mean emphasis with a, as a noun or a verb? Emphasis as the console. Okay, gotcha. Um, <laughs> Well, I, <laughs> I don't know if it's an honor of her, but it was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I can only speak um, from rumor about that because I wasn't involved with ETC during the emphasis days. Um, I was off doing other things and then kind of got involved with the company again when they decided that they wanted to do a new console. Um, but, you know, certainly, and so maybe some of you have been longer than me in that regard. To speak to it. Um, you know, emphasis learned a lot from that. And we also learned from that that in order for us as console manufacturers to make this successful, th that integration was the key component of that. And making this, it couldn't, you know, your focus whenever you develop a new feature set is on making something, that, you know, that isn't germane to getting a show done. It speeds it up, like pixel mapping. You don't have to have pixel mapping on the desk. It's very helpful. Magic sheets, you don't have to have it. Um, it's helpful. This is sort of the same thing. Um, 
is to make sure that it's as integrated into the workflow and the, the thought of the desk is you possibly can make it so it doesn't feel like other. And, and that is, and I think if we look at what we learned from emphasis, that informed in the early days of my, you know, the discussions that Dennis and I and Rick Ciarto had about how this would work, it was really about integration. And, you know, that, those ideas without any discussion with Lowell just carried forward when we turned the project on a few years ago. Yeah, I'll say one of the things that I did when I took on this project is I met with a lot of our support and documentation resources and, and who had been on the front lines of some of the emphasis stuff. And one of the, the takeaways I had from that was emphasis was incredibly powerful at its time, but it was also a little bit ahead of its time. And what it could do required so much upfront work and so much configuration, and that, that caused issues for, for many aspects of it. And so I use that as a little bit of a, I guess, cautionary tale is the best way to phrase it. Um, and looking at, okay, we want to get these tools to you as easily and as, as quickly as possible. So one of the, the main decisions we made very early on was we did not want to be a drafting program. We did not want to give you full 3D drafting abilities inside of Augmented. Instead, we wanted to focus on using the work that you've already done. So if you had that SketchUp model, if you have that Vectorworks model, uh, being able to bring in as much of that work as possible. Um, I think one of the things that people struggled with with emphasis was how many steps you had to do to get working and whether or not it was really worth the amount of effort you had to do up front. And I think just uh, the, the world has changed. Technology has changed. The power we all have at our fingertips now makes it so much easier for us to make these steps into this 3D world. Um, you know, things like the uh, FPE fixture position estimator that we have it's technology that is, is relatively new, but concepts that have been around for a while. Um, so making it so that we can make this much more accessible. So yeah, I think we did absolutely learn from Emphasis. And, and I think there are some things that Emphasis did great that we've included. And there are some things that Emphasis had some issues with that uh, we've improved upon. So a thought popped into my head, it's not necessarily 100% germane to what we're talking about, but I want to say it anyway before I forget, because I will. Um, you know, in one of the things in the lead up to this that we certainly got a ton of feedback on was people who, you know, you have all this work that you've done in Vectorworks, that as an example, but certainly in certain of our markets, Vectorworks is the tool. And then, you know, you come in, this is before 3 l you come into EOS and then you have to manually make your magic sheets and then you have to manually make your pixel maps because you now you're doing this work three times. And so one of the things that for anyone who was seeing the 3.0 that might not have discovered yet. And this is early days. There's some refinement that needs to happen here. You can actually create a magic sheet out of your import from Vectorworks and you can create a pixel map. Um, again, it's a sketch at the moment of where we want to take it, but we're looking, kind of speaking of the integration aspect again, of now that I've done all this work, how many places can that work be deployed? So I'm not having to do it over and over again. And if you haven't had a chance to try the augmented to magic sheet function, it is super cool. Um, and I highly, highly recommend it. Very cool. Hey, uh, there are a couple of questions here. I'm just going to knock out real fast. Uh, let's talk about hog for a second and just get it out of the way. Uh, yes, we are absolutely looking at what possibilities can be made with throughout the entire line of ETC products, not just hog. Um, you know, I've always thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you could use that mobile app with Augmented and look, find a gateway and change its port. Um, so we are focusing exclusively on EOS right now. Uh, and then we will take a look at, oh, God, Augmented came up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a way to delete a question? No. Um, so, you know, as, as mentioned earlier, part of my job is to figure out ways that ETC can better talk to ETC. Um, and with high-end systems being a uh, powerful new element, not so new anymore, it's been what, a year and a half now, two years? Um, it, we are absolutely looking at where this technology can expand out throughout the rest of the company. I can't give you anywhere near any form of timelines or ideas about when we'll see what, um, but you know, we're starting with EOS, we're integrating with EOS, we're developing with EOS, but yeah. we will absolutely be taking a look at other options. With something like this, what you really need to do is get the feature set to a certain point of maturity before spread, otherwise everything is slowed down if you're trying to do too many things at one time. 
Um, so the focus has been on the integration with EOS. Let's focus on the market segment that's, that's serviced by this product line. Mature the feature set, make sure we understand everything we need to know about how it integrates into the software, and then look at where it could be deployed elsewhere. Absolutely. Uh, you guys have talked about this uh, a little bit, but I wanted to talk about the um, the 3.0 beta forums. So yeah. um, for those of you watching who are in the forums, thank you so much for participating in your feedback. Um, for those of you who are not, uh, also in the Augmented for Educators video is how to join the forums, and that's where you get the, the beta software. Um, but I know this, beta, which we've, we do beta uh, for every release of EOS, or have for a long time um, on the forums, but I know this one was a little bit bigger uh, <laughs> than previous ones. So can y'all talk about uh, kind of the difference in in that, like all the betas before this one, um, two point whatever versus 3.0, um, and how it's been helpful, uh, and just the kind of what that process has been like with so yeah. many folks in the, in the um, beta program. Well, it's interesting. Um, we have a lot more people in beta for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, no one's in production at the moment except for a few television studios and whatnot. Um, and also, what's been interesting about this is we typically, it's, it's you know, you can't beta on Broadway. Nobody does that because it's, it's just too risky. And so now, what, and in, in any, you know, it's just something that people can't, don't have the time for. What's kind of interesting to us right now is we're getting people who participate, who are, you know, professional level users in Broadway, West End, live share television who are beta testing for us, which, and they don't normally have the time for that. And so the, the feedback has brought, I mean, we always get a high professional user group, but it's a much more active group than it has been in the past. And we made the decision, and this was before even we had the COVID-19 shutdowns, we could see the activity that was happening on the on the beta forum, the, close, the open beta forum. And we actually hired, and this turned out to be really looking back at it, one of the smartest decisions we ever made. We hired three of our programmers who now don't have programming jobs to be our beta moderators. And we were just getting swamped with the level of feedback that we had. It was impossible for the team to keep up. And so when this whole thing happened, we had three people who were already trained and active in moderating the beta forums. They're acting as our gatekeeper of answering questions. They, they will look at things and know whether it's an SCR, whether we've written a defect report or a feature request on it or not. And that has been hugely helpful because we wouldn't be able to handle the amount of traffic. Without a doubt. Uh, just remember, guys, there are probably 10 of us who are active on the forums, including those three beta moderators. There are about 4,000 of you, uh, and we love that, and we're super excited about that. But if you don't get a response for a few minutes, just you know, give us a little bit of time. Um, you know, one of the things um, that we also wanted to focus with the beta process on this was while we, we try to get feedback from all different levels of users, we really wanted to focus on some of the education groups uh, for, for Augmented because we, we felt like that was going to be a strong target environment for this feature. Um, so we reached out early to to a number of educational users um, trying to get that. And that opened up a, a really interesting new world for us, you know, trying to keep an eye on the perspectives from, from Broadway and, high, and uh, West End uh, down to regional theaters, down and across the board through all of our different users, um, trying to open it up a little bit uh, faster than we normally do to get some more feedback in, in the different areas, which has worked out really, really well. Yeah, and the slowdown here, you know, um, the fact that, you know, we're not, largely people aren't in production at the moment, means we also have a little bit more time than we normally would have to address things. A lot of times when you're coming up on the end of a project and you need to get it released for a variety of different reasons, whatever those might be, you start, well, we'll do that in the next release. Um, this is giving us a little bit more time to address some of those issues that we might have, like, you know, we might have pushed off until 3-1 in the past. So it's been a, it's, it's been an, it's, it's definitely been different than any beta we've done before without any question. Yeah, without a doubt. I don't think we've ever gotten anywhere near 4,000 participants. Yeah, what is, how many would you say is an average For open beta, number of beta users um, previous to now? 
we usually get a couple hundred. We're in, the, we're in the thousands at the moment. You know, we run beta in three. We have an alpha group that looks at early software concepts. We do proof of concept because, you know, a lot of times something that sounds good on paper doesn't play out in the real world. So we'll go through the paper cycle of this is how we want a feature to work, and then we'll, we'll start building it. We'll put it out to a, a small group of users to go, okay, is this what we're all thinking? Does this still make sense to us? And then we go into a closed beta cycle. We're pretty much always in closed beta, always. Um, in fact, we're about to start closed beta for 3.1. Um, and then toward the end, and that's another point that's been different on this. You know, usually open beta is like, this is the final seal of approval before we go to the to release. Just is it, did we is anything bad happened in the code that we didn't catch through all of the other methods that we have? Um, this is this is the most protect, protracted open beta cycle we've ever had. Um, just because of the timing of everything, and it's it's proving to be really valuable to developers to get this level of feedback. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that we did a little differently, as Anne just mentioned, was we pushed ourselves to open beta sooner than we normally would. Um, and that was very calculated. And it was it was for a couple of reasons. One, this is a major shift for us, right? This is is not necessarily building off of something and adding in a new feature like we've done in the past. This is a whole new module we are completely integrating. So we wanted to just bluntly, make sure we weren't messing it up. We wanted to get feedback on that as soon as possible. But one of the other reasons we did this so early um, is there are so very, very many fixture types out there. Uh, and we don't have access to all of them, and you do. And so getting that feedback of, hey, the gobo in this one is upside down, or hey, this one pans when it should have tilt, or anything like that has been invaluable. Um, and by no means will we have every fixture in the world nailed perfectly by the time we release. And we, we acknowledge that, and we will, of course, continue to work and support that. Um, but being able to get this in as many people's hands as possible, as soon as possible, uh, has, has really been hugely beneficial. And I just want to thank everybody for that, because, you know, the feedback we've gotten has shaped this product more than, more than we thought it would, and we're, we're really excited for that. But also being able to uh, to tweak things on the fly. And, you know, we, we had that conversation a little earlier about, hey, imports in a slightly different place than it was at the beginning of beta. Yeah, that was from a lot of feedback from you saying, hey, wouldn't it make sense to put it here? Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, to change my mind and, and follow uh, the advice there. So it's been great. So how, like Lowell and Ann, you both kind of touched on this a little bit. So we've gotten, you know, through this beta process, through uh, trade shows and conversations and meeting with users. How do we, or how do you prioritize these requests? Uh, well, you said recently we did a 180 on something uh, last week. Um, so how how do y'all juggle the requests between, oh, that's a really good idea, but it's gonna slow down, it's gonna delay it by a month versus, well, it works okay now. I mean, how do you, how do you guys make those decisions and like what kind of ones have been have been challenging that could jump to mind? I think that the the hardest decision is 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 this going to happen now or does this have to wait? Um, and inevitably, every decision you make, you're going to make some people very happy and you're going to make some people very unhappy. Um, you know, there is there are many different thoughts about how to do this. You know, and I'm sure Ann and I use slightly different methods. Um, I try very hard not to make decisions in a vacuum, as I mentioned earlier. So I will 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 you know, start with my gut reaction to what we should do. And we have this wonderful gentleman, Matt Halberstadt, who I think will be joining us, who is our technical product manager. Matt is the, the true liaison to the R&D process. So, you know, we'll take a look at something. So, you know, let's say, okay, feature request A comes in and we'll take a look at it and say, all right, first of all, is it aligned with, in align with what we are planning to do for this particular release? So, you know, something like adding Prodigy support in is probably a little bit outside of our scope for this particular release. So that would be our first thing. All right. It's not in alignment. We're, we're going to push that. Still consider it, just not for right now. Um, taking a look at, at pure time. Okay, is this a, a 30 second fix? Is this a three month fix with huge amounts of test implementation? Um, you know, looking through and weighing all these balances is a very hard decision. Um, and you know, I try to avoid the 80 20 conversations. Right? Is this 80 percent of the users? Is this 20 percent of the users? I, you know, it's for me. It's a little bit more what is best for the product. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, they're definitely going to be all right. Is, is one person going to be running to this every 
you know, third Thursday under a blue, you know, a blue moon, or is it going to be something that a user will um, hit more often than not? Uh, and then the last one for me is, you know, does it just affect the product? Is, is this a crash? Okay, yeah, we really should fix that. Is this, you know, you have to hit two buttons instead of one? Maybe we should talk about it. Yeah, I mean, we look at those things. Uh, for, uh, you know, uh, my focus is always on data. <laughs> um, uh, we One of the things that on the EOS side that we prioritize always is anything that's going to impact the way the data gets stored um, first, because we, we, you know, we have a mission statement on this project that we have lived up to since 1.3, which is the last time. We screwed up um, not to break show files, and that a show always has to play back the same way. Um, that's a mission statement for us and everything we do. And the few times that we have said, no, you know, we're making a big enough change. Everyone can just go in and rewrite their snapshots. When we re-architect snapshots and we all agree as a group, yes, we're going to break snapshots in whatever release that was. And then two weeks before, we're like, no, no, we can't possibly do this. Our thing is always on not breaking show files. So we will always prioritize anything that we believe will materially impact the way the data is stored. So that we're not going to make a change from 3.1, from 3.0 to 3.1 that does something that breaks your file. Um, and so that's always the first um, priority. Um, and also then workflow. <laughs> People learn habits. And once you've learned a habit, it's hard to undo that habit. So we will put those two things at the top of the queue. And we always try to make, you know, the graphics look good and things. But for the most part, cosmetics, as much as we do focus on those things, if those have to slide, those have to slide because we're going to focus on workflow and the, tra and the show file first. I think is kind of the way we always approach it. In addition to the things that also. Has there been any feedback uh, back on augmented specifically from users that have taken it in a in a hugely different direction over the development period? Um, Good question. Um, and hugely is obviously very subjective, but you know, one of the things that we we went real deep on was where augmented should actually live, and you know, the concept of having it in the tab versus uh, a full screen on a monitor. Um, and we were we we did do a little bit of a 180 on on that throughout some of the different discussions with some users, um, and I'm super happy with where we ended up. I think the putting it in the tab was absolutely the right decision. Well, let's be honest, we fought like cats and dogs over that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, we made I mean, shimmy in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if you're in the forums right now, one of the big ones we're talking about is this concept of uh, nesting versus grouping. Um, good conversations there. Um, we've had a lot of great user feedback on that and helped us really shape our decisions. But yeah, I think those are the two big ones that jumped to mind. David, any questions uh, from uh, from the group about what we're talking about here? About what we're talking about specifically here? Um, no, I mean we have a few questions we could definitely come through and, and talk about. Um, Somebody did. Well, but you want to do a change? Are we, are we ready for a topic change? Is the question? Yeah. I, um, while you're reading through those, I did see a question pop up about timeframes for 3O. We should just put that out there. Um, you know, we, as I said earlier, we are taking our time at this point because very few people are in production to do more work than we would normally do to try to get 3.0 where we want it. Um, we are in the midst of having discussions about a revised time frame. There is no doubt that this lockdown that we are experiencing globally is impacting our time frames. So um, not everyone is working 100% of the time at the moment. Um, by design, not because they're well enough. I want to make that clear. Um, so um, we do anticipate releasing this summer, by the end of the summer for sure. Don't have a tight time frame on it yet, but we are working toward those dates now. Those are that's an active discussion. So we are definitely narrowing in on a release. And a lot on the EOS side, most of the team is off on three one already. We only have a few people working on three zero at this point. The augmented time side is almost exclusively still on our quote one on one zero. 
Cool. We have some hardware yep. questions, but before I look at those, there's a couple of, uh, of software thoughts, um, and maybe these are in the forum as bigger discussions, but have there been thoughts or discussions within augmented software of being able to incorporate with the AV aspects that we're seeing in modern productions? And um, is there ways within augmented to be able to show and display tracking versus uh, other, other recording methods? Uh, so for AV aspects, we definitely had some conversations, and I can see some things in the future, um, cameras or, or media definitely becoming uh, an interesting part. Um, nothing really planned for, for version one, but uh, as I mentioned, it's the world we can keep adding things to. Um, as for the, the tracking element, um, you know, augmented does use the same color codes as the main EOS uh, data display. Um, so we've got a lot of features there. And as you step through, um, nothing really specific to, to tracking. Um, that'd be an interesting thing to take a look question, at if you're. Is there a tracking queue only flag? In the queue? Is that the, the, the question was, was honestly just the word tracking and a question mark. Um, so I may be doing some assumption and extrapolation in terms of how do you view tracking in augmented. Um, the person that asked that question, if you want to clarify, please feel free to do so. Um, yeah, I can't. We talked about putting the, you know, in the upper corner of the live blind screen, we always have a tracking queue only thing, just while whoever's answering. Um, we talked about putting that in the augmented tab. I don't remember if it ever went in or not. Yeah. Live tracking for playback. Live tracking away. for playback, a way to rival some IR utilities available. Oh, 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 human tracking. Human. Ah, oh. well, that's different. Never mind. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as opposed to human so, queue only. Or human trafficking, as I accidentally say, everyone. So, uh, especially after long international flights. I know, I brought it up with you. Um, so, we have done some interesting things with the, the changes to the IRFR and ARFR app um, that allow you to do some, some really cool locational-based programming using the AR, uh, AR Kit and AR Core functionalities on Android and iOS devices. Um, and while that does let you do some things like walk around your stage and have your lights go and follow you, um, is, is really a powerful thing, uh, what we are finding is that those devices, so the phone that you have in your pocket, is fantastic for point-to-point. -point. It does not have the latency and the accuracy that an IR system or a true human tracking, I say it right this time, uh, functionality will have. Um, and the decision that we made was we wanted to offer a tool that you could use right off the bat. You didn't have to buy a very expensive uh, or powerful secondary system. You had a tool in your pocket, literally, uh, that you could use. So while we are focusing on accessibility and using that more as a focusing tool, not a tracking tool, um, we definitely do want to explore some of those functionalities uh, in the future. Can you guys talk about, we've had a, a I know that the focus is obviously on getting 3.0 released. Um, can we talk about a little bit uh, features that we'll see down the road in 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 4.0, like, however far you want to go um, that on the, from the augmented side? So uh, I know you guys kind of categorize things as, you know, a suggestion will come in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they fall into things we have to fix before we release um, because it crashes your system or you know a catastrophic failure versus, oh, that's a really cool idea, but it can wait versus that's a really cool idea and we have to do it now. So let's delay the process. Like, to me, there's kind of those three options, but correct me if I'm wrong and explain kind of some things that are in each of those categories. Go ahead, Lowell. Okay. <laughs> uh, so one of the big things that I want to tackle next is uh, improving on where we are with the scenic objects movable and the scenic objects and getting that position data from external sources. Um, so something like a ETC rigging system or a, a POSI stage or 159 is the new rigging. Yeah, so 159. Um, you know, so the ability to say, okay, I want to link my my table, um, my seat, my set piece, whatever, uh, to a incoming data positioning stream, 
and have that move throughout. So right now you can go in and you can associate any objects inside of Augmented with an EOS channel, and then you can reposition it wherever uh, you want uh, in, in the space using just regular view-based commands. Um, but we want to take that a little further and have that automated from, from an external system. Uh, and then the, the fun evolution from that is, okay, cool, so we have this position moving around. Can that object be a focus palette? So can the chair itself be a focus palette? And whenever you move your chair, whoever it's going to be, all of that goes from there. Some things that would be really, really helpful. Thank you, Dan Murphin, for making sure I said uh, 159 correctly. I appreciate you. Um, so, you know, just ways we can integrate from there is, is a huge one uh, that I want to work on. And uh, the other thing I want to focus on for a three run release is some ways to make creating a space uh, a little quicker. So, if you are not playing in a 3D world, uh, if you do not have a SketchUp or a Vectorworks file, uh, I have a, a rough idea, and don't hold me to this yet, of, of a sort of a space wizard. So tell us a little bit about your space, and we'll we'll create a 3D model that's similar. Um, so some places we can do that, along with some concepts about uh, uh, hanging positions and, and a few other things. So just make the initial setup be a little bit more fluid, a little bit faster. Um, you know, we've we've talked a lot about how we can make your programming experience faster and, and more powerful. There are definitely some things that you need to do to get to that point. Um, that we, I think we've, we've made some great advances in, in simplifying, but I think we can go further with that. Just on that note, there was a question from Mark uh, who said, I run a high school PAC and I'm about to buy a GUF5, so I'm going to be building my rep plot uh, and patch from scratch. Any tips for things to make using, any, any tips to make augmented easier? So I think that space yeah. wizard yes. idea yeah. uh, would certainly yeah. apply there. And then I can I'm, say, um, kind of anecdotally, uh, I, I've done this. It, I've built a, a black box from, from scratch at our facility down in Austin at high-end systems. And I had no model. Um, and with basically a tape measure and an afternoon, I was able to pretty accurately create the space. So it, I, you know, and I did that completely in augmented. I did not use a CAD program to do that. So- Nick and I uh, did that in a ballroom in Newark. That was fun. Um, you know, I, I think you're doing one of the best things you could do right now is, is watching some of these videos, uh, the workbook videos and the sort of training videos that Rob is going to be hosting for the next bit of time are, are fantastic. Um, and they'll be huge and great resources for you too. Can I break in just one second? Because we haven't actually talked about that. Um, so yeah. back well, January, um, Nick and Rob, who are the voices of EOS and the Center, as you both know, as you all know, sorry. Um, shot they, they did a specific augmented workbook it's a companion piece to the four level books that we have now um so they um shot a video for that um we are planning to put the workbook up the videos are still being edited um we are planning to put the workbook up on the open beta forum shortly and that will be the material that rob leverages off of when he starts the specific augmented training classes in two weeks. Um, so as soon as those materials are available, we will get them out to everyone. But I did see a question come through, is there, where can I watch videos of this for training purposes? Those will be coming in the meantime, as David said, on the ETC YouTube channel, um, Lowell's Augmented for Educators, I think is probably the, is that right? Would you guys say the best resource at the moment? For getting started, yeah, I would agree. All right. Um, Going back to the uh, uh, simplification idea, one of the things that I've found is that uh, uh, what you want to get out of it is what you put into it. So if I need to have just, uh, uh, if I'm in a school venue and I have four lights and I don't care about the click to focus and all of that stuff, and I just want to have an idea of where my lights are focusing, that's something that we could do really, really, really quickly. Obviously, walking around with a cell phone is not going to have quite the same accuracy, but if I just need to look in the blind and have an idea of what's happening, I don't need to go through all of the 3D drafting sort of stuff. That's something I can lay out very fast. And so I've done it within an hour without, without even using a, uh, any sort of uh, tape measure or anything like that, just by building things. And, and we can talk about that as we move ahead with the, with, with the, uh, uh, the information is how we can do this both really in depth to get us a really strong sort of 
uh, applications of the FDUs that, that we want, but also in sort of a, a, a less important venue where I just need, okay, I just need to have an idea of what's happening in the background. That's something we can add to the, the system very quickly. Yeah, in that way, it's very much like, like magic sheets. Like you can yeah. spend as little or as much time creating magic sheet as you want to. You can make one down and dirty and it serves your purpose. It's just blocks on a screen that show color and that's all you need. Or you can create an entire programming surface that you're going to you know, run a festival with. So it's sort of purpose driven, like you're saying, Jason, if you just need a little, it doesn't take that much effort. If you need pinpoint accuracy, it's gonna take a little bit longer to, to create. One of the other things Rob and I have been kicking around is an idea of doing a streaming build an augmented session. So kind of, you know, mixer twitch twitch esque. Um, literally it's just one of us with the augmented screen up just showing you how we go from start to scratch. Um, what I think we decided on, Rob, correct me if, if you're thinking something else, is we'll do the workbooks and then we'll do one of those. So kind of as a summation about what we trained in the workbooks. So it either be spliced in between some of those workbook videos or at the end. Um, and we'll just do a, you know, whether we do it on WebEx or Twitch or Mixer or whatever. Uh, we'll figure all that out. Um, just literally watching over our shoulder as one of us builds an augmented fake theater, napkin cats kind of sketch from, from scratch all the way through. That's a really great idea. Yeah, I think that'd be fun. Because it's, you know, we do have a lot of documentation, which our tech writer Alex Libre has put together, but for a feature like this, it's hard, to, it can be hard to deconstruct written documentation. Yeah. To I think out. Just, just watching the, the experience would be fun. Yeah. What do I do first? <laughs> More information coming on that when Rob and I figure out exactly how we're going to put that into all of these different videos that we're doing, but uh, definitely planning on, on offering that. How are we doing on questions over here? Are there plans yeah, to integrate a Bluetooth measuring device like a Leica distro do to help update real world fixture position? Hmm. That'd be fun. Maybe. There's a couple of hardware questions here, which I think Matt Halberstadt may be joining us shortly. So I might hang yeah. on to those for to join for Matt. Although Lowell and I can likely add, well, all of us can probably add. Yeah, what do we got? Uh, with such a powerful upgrade but limited hardware, can we expect other hardware upgrades soon <laughs> in products? ATC is always working on new and exciting products. You asked. You, I, I was going to totally <laughs> dodge that question, but you, uh, you no, asked. You know what? You got to go there. Um, yeah. I think it is while we wait for them. One of the things to note, and there is documentation on this, that in order to run this suite uh, natively on a desk, you have to have a desk that has DV, uh, at least one display port on it. And if you have early generation TIs and GEOs that have just uh, DVI, you're going to have to run a laptop in tethered mode, which basically is something we've been talking about doing for a long time anyway, so that's great because it's our first step for a sort of static display on the side. Uh, and that's not because we're being punitive, that's because the graphics cards that were in those early desks would not support the graphics that we need to be able to run augmented um, early as well. Unfortunately, it is just what it is. Technology moves on. Those desks, you know, I think Geo is now 10 years old. Um, things move quickly in the technology sector. We are always keeping our eye out and on how to keep the products that we are shipping current. Um, I can't tell you that we have any plans at the moment for changing out currently shipping products so that you could run it and, you know, have better performance. Um, we also deliberately um, hamper the, the resolution when you're running internally. Um, because again, processing power on those desks, it just won't support a huge rig. Yeah, so on, on, if you're running augmented in a tab on a console, you'll be limited to low and medium quality. Uh, if you are running it on a tethered Mac or PC, you'll get access to high and ultra qualities. Which is um, pretty good though on yeah. the desks, you know. But you know I, I will say on my little Dell Latitude convertible laptop two-in-one thing that I use for my day-to-day, -day, I very rarely leave medium, and it gives me most of what I need. If I am doing a trade show or doing a big presentation or really getting high end into graphics, then I will uh, bust out the Alienware, um, which does really fantastically. Um, so it, it really comes down to what you have. You will always get the same functionalities between the quality levels. It's just going to be, okay, are my Gobos 
more static or are they, you know, draping over the table correctly? Um, hey, Rob, do you actually have uh, EOS running that you could share and just show that quality page real fast? Oh, sure. Um, question also just came up right. with tethered PCs. Does this now negate the need for a client dongle? I.e., can designers now run tethered without having to run mirror? We had a couple of questions coming about tethered mode. Can you take some time to talk about that, or is this not the right class for that? Yeah, now is a good time. Yeah, so um, basically the way tethered is going to work is if you are running on a device that has a dongle or has or is a, a Nomad puck or um, hardware, you can put that into a tethered mode, uh, and that will always give you a tab-based augmented, kind of like what we're seeing right here. And we'll talk about the show file and some other fun things for this in a second. If you are using a standalone Mac or PC and you want to network that into your system, you have two options. If you are bringing that in as a client, so it has a dongle plugged into that machine, you would get all of your normal tab systems and you can have augmented in a tab on one of those. If you are not using a client, you have a second, there's a new option. So kind of like where you have your primary backup and client, there's a new one which is augmented tether. That will open up just the augmented window. You do not require a client dongle for that. But one thing we need to make really clear here is you get one augmented window. So if you are running it on your console and you have an augmented thing, it's going to run locally, you would not do it anything tethered. If you have it on tethered, you're only going to get it on the tethered. And that is really just because of the resources that it's using. And if we had multiple windows all rendering simultaneously, uh, we could really take down the graphical processing of that. As Mr. Halberstadt can speak to quite well. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the chaos. Welcome to the chaos, Matt. Quick, uh, a quick additional question on tethered mode. Um, with, if you are in tethered mode, are the mouse and keyboard on the console able to control the tethered mode machine? Not right now, but it is something we are looking to add in the future. Um, that being said, snapshots, if you are sharing, user will. Um, my hearing augmented Nomad. Uh, so, you know, it, it's in the software Nomad right now. There is no real standalone concept. It's just whether which mode you're in this for those two like. Hey, uh, so just jumping back to quality for a second. Rob, can you just click on the options and on uh, the quality there? So inside, you're going to get these uh, these three different areas you can modify. So your easiest and quickest are your quality levels, so low, medium, high, and ultra. If you want to get really specific, you can actually go in and limit an FPS rate, uh, frames per second, um, just giving you some options there. Underneath that, you're going to have uh, how how precise is it? So if you take a look at switching between these different ones, so if you go to optimize, you'll notice that's our, our real bare bones. So that's not going to have a huge amount of impact on the graphics. Um, it's going to show gobos in both the cutoff place and the, the base place. Um, so it's giving you that uh, not that really nice sort of realistic uh, wrapping inside there. Uh, if you go to approximated there, Rob, you can see that's going to give you just the top piece and not cast those shadows and those other lines down. Uh, and then realistic is, is going to be um, the, the powerful one. Um, so I will say that nine times out of 10, I run in this mode that you're seeing right now. So medium for my quality and realistic for my lighting. Um, so you know, that gives me the ability to, to play in a little bit of best of both worlds. If you have that nicer graphics based uh, PC or Mac, putting it up to higher ultra really does make it look great. Um, but it's just, you know, what, what do you have uh, available to you and, and how are you integrating things together? And I will say in two weeks when we start the, the, the work through, we'll, I'll, I'll probably play with these to see, especially since I'm sharing a screen with all of you, like if there's lag and so we may go on a lower uh, quality just to help, help everybody keep up through the, through the WebEx. We had a couple of questions come in, in the, that are all kind of asking the same thing in a slightly different way. Um, I want to try and rephrase these into kind of a single question, which I think is going to be the answer. What is ETC's best practice suggestions for using augmented during a technical rehearsal where you may need to have uh, multiple monitors or multiple setups set up in, in, throughout your theater where you would want to have different people having the ability to view or access what's going on in the console and in Augmented? 
especially if we can only have one augmented window open on it or one augmented device running at a time. Good question. Um, that was like, that's a combination of like three different questions that came in all around the same kind of topic. So I think it comes down to there are a couple of questions I will ask back first before I make a recommendation. Um, one, are you willing to sacrifice tab space on your your screen? So if you're on something like an Ion XE and you only have you know you're only using two screens, do you want to give up half a screen, a whole screen to to augment it? And if the answer is yes and you're not too concerned about running the lower qualities, absolutely just run it on board on the tab. If you don't want to give up that programming space, uh, then I would take a look at uh, doing uh, a secondary uh, tethered machine just to put that information over on a secondary screen. Um, the other one I would ask is, is, do you want to always run at that really nice higher quality? If the answer is yes, then I would absolutely take a look at uh, running on a tethered. Um, I kind of switch back and forth. So you take a look at, at what's Rob is sharing right now. This is a show file I wrote, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it's it's really nice half and half. It's got a match sheet on one side, it's got documents on the other, and I can switch back and forth between my tabs to see what I want. Um, if I was programming a massive show, I would probably not want to be using uh, that much space for augments that I would want it tethered on the secondary machine. So really for me, it's it's do you want the higher quality? Or do you want uh, to conserve your space? And if you answered yes to either of those, I would take a look. And I'll, I'll add on that a little bit, Lowell. So this is a way you can kind of uh, cheat a little bit and get an extra monitor. So if you're on an Ion XE, which has a limit of two monitors, if you have a, a computer, probably a laptop, uh, to spare, and you can run it in tethered, which will gain you a third screen, effectively. Uh, yeah, just, without without a, without a dongle or, or anything else, and then the the other thing that I don't think we addressed in the question, uh, or maybe just to clarify, so we can do one augmented tab per piece of uh, per device. So if you have a primary in the booth and then a, a Nomad puck for the designer at the tech table, those can each be running an augmented tab. Um, it's not it's not one augmented tab per per session. It's thank you for clarifying that because I think I misspoke a little bit on that. Yeah, You're thank absolutely you for right. clarifying that because that answered a couple of the questions that came in because someone was asking about like an RVI for augmented uh, to be able to put on their tech table, but you could just run a computer in tethered mode and give people that option. Mm -hmm. uh, another question came in. Can you tether a Mac running augmented from a Windows running Nomad? Absolutely. You can mix and match hardware as much as you can. Really no different than tethering to a console to a Mac with no matter or vice versa. Um, we should give a shout out to Miserac, Duffy, and the rest of the team. Uh, yeah, some of our developers. Hello, Mr. Simmons. Uh, absolutely, we have an incredible team and they are all working incredibly hard to, to put this forth and it's been a hugely, hugely awesome experience. Well, I'll do you want to talk a little bit, a bit about what we're looking at here? Um, and then if we want to open up some of the other, yeah, uh, the three venues you've created, we can just sure. So let's, uh, let's just chat about that real fast. I think that's a, a great time. So, um, one of the questions that came up fairly recently was, do we have any example venues, uh, that we can make available? And the answer is yes. So, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, I did a class on augmented for educators and introduced three new venues. Um, so we have a proscenium theater, a uh, concert venue, and a fashion show runway style thing um, using some of the built-in uh, models that we have inside of uh, Augmented. Um, fair warning, those were really just me playing around, putting pictures in random places, and I'm not a very good designer, so it might not be the best places. Uh, the proscenium one actually was designed by Tom Luttrell, who is a real designer. He did a great um, so those are available at etcconnect.com slash augmented. Uh, if you go there, there is a tab called documents. Um, go there and we've got zip files uh, for the uh, examples there. Um, for the proscenium one, it's the EO show file, a printout of the patch, uh, and I also did include a Vectorworks show file for that, or a Vectorworks file for that as well. Um, for the other two, it's just the EO show file, including the model and the patch. Um, PDF, so you've got options to play with that. Um, they've got some groups and pixel maps and some other stuff built into it. Uh, and then we wanted to go a little bit further 
and I've been talking with a bunch of professors around, uh, around the world um, about ways we could potentially help um, with, with distance learning and using augmented in more of an education venue. So what you're looking at right now is the augmented light lab. Uh, and what it is, is the ability to put uh, up to 10 fixtures into a space really wherever you want. So Rob, if you want to just uh, show a little bit of how it works, you can select a fixture, click on any of the locations uh, using the green buttons. Uh, on the right hand side, you've got color and intensity options. Um, so it gives you the ability to come in and uh, just sort of place fixtures wherever you want, uh, turn them on, and they uh, will focus. Oh, you, I need to get you a slightly more recent version, fixes one of those focus issues. Uh, so you can kind of come in and take a look at how angles and colors um, and, and breakups work inside of space. So making this uh, really a, a fairly simple, straightforward tool. We're talking about direction of light, color, um, how, to, how to craft a look inside of a scene. Um, and so this will be available on the website either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Um, it will, I will probably just put a link in the forums. We have a full site. Uh, the other thing that is really nice is, Rob, if you click on the little help file uh, on the, the user panel there, uh, it does actually step you through the, uh, there's a little built-in help. So uh, where to get help, um, and then how to use that. Oh, is it up now? Awesome, thank you. I didn't remember exactly when it's going to go up. Uh, so this will be, it's apparently up now. Uh, go take a look. This will be hopefully a, a way to, to talk to your students about light, about color. Um, the way I program this is that it uh, hopefully doesn't require anyone to, to know how to use either augmented or EOS almost at all. Um, so just the ability to come in and use this magic sheet with this, this augmented file uh, to around and talk about light. Hopefully that'll be useful to everybody. And uh, I've already gotten some, some feedback uh, on ways we could add some more features, so we'll probably see some more versions. What type of magic sheet objects are the green boxes? Um, a very, very scary list of macros. Look at the macro. There are a lot of macros running with this behind the scenes. I mean, you know, feel free to look in there if you want to poke around, but that's some crazy things. Yeah, uh, here, let me see if that is. We'll pick behind the curtain here. Ah, uh, stay out of that. That's scary. <laughs> All right, that is indeed up now. So if you go to etcconnect.com slash augmented, there'll be a tab, which is the Augmented Light Lab. Um, it's got instructions on how to enroll in the beta, um, download, where you can download the show file, uh, some screenshots of it, system requirements, and uh, the file itself. A link has been posted inside the Q&A. And yes, as soon as I get out of this, I will go make a post about it in the forums. And I think we're also doing a social media blast about it tomorrow. Trying to get the word out. So do we want to look at the other? So, yeah, go ahead and show the other ones. That's a great idea. Uh, we'll look at the proscenium first. There we go. Whoops. Oh, yeah, I'm going to pull that down a little. I, I would probably drop yourself down a little for, for web passing. Yeah, so there's a, a proscenium venue here. I believe, Lowell, none of the lights are, none of the conventional fixtures are focused. Is that true? No, we wanted so to very part specifically of the, part of the experience. that you do that. Yeah, so everything is, is, is positioned, gelled, um, and uh, but not not focused or uh, have their their beam angles set or anything like that. So you can go through, or sorry, the beam edges set so you can mess around with that and use it as a, a tool to focus on whatever objects you add into the space. Um, it's just a, a rep plot uh, designed by Tom Luttrell. Got a couple of movers in it and a couple of LEDs, but it's a mostly conventional rig. So that is our first venue. Then our next one is what we call concert. Right. Change your right. yeah. like the, the, the cast. So this is more of a a band set up here. We've got a lot of moving lights in this one.
And yeah, like you said, well, each of these has a, a patch PDF with it. Uh, if you guys want to learn, or you can simply open up the patch tab and see what's what. Oop, that, that zooms apparently. <laughs> and then our final one, uh, which is what I'll be using uh, starting next week for our walkthrough is called Fashion Show. And this one has uh, a few, uh, it's got, so we have conventionals, we have LED PARs, we've got some moving fixtures, and then we also have a pixel map of uh, linear fixtures across the runway here. So I thought this would give us the most uh, options to look at as we go through the software. So in two weeks, tune in and we'll be going through this venue. And then at, at some point we'll also start from scratch uh, just to learn all the, all the different tools and features of the software. David, any other questions? I've got this up so I can't see anything. Uh, one question um, that might be, and it's the only question we have sitting in here right now. Um, can we talk a little bit about texture elements? Um, right now with everything being gray, it gets a little hard to be able to distinguish between things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's some coloring and texturing stuff is, is slated for uh, some three one work. Um, right now, if you add a uh, one of the basic shapes, so the cube, the sphere, the pyramid, so on and so forth, uh, you do have some options for some default colors. Um, we do want to take a look at doing a recoloring engine. Um, so if you have one of the gray objects, you can select a, an RGB color and, and um, make that be a thing. Um, whether or not we go to a full texturing engine in 3.1 is yet to be fully determined. There's a lot of, of bits and pieces that go along with that. But uh, if nothing else, uh, we'll be taking a look at uh, doing some form of, of recoloring concept. So yeah, if you bring in something and you want to do it a tweak, um, or if you want to use one of those stock objects we have and make it be purple, um, definitely some options there. Any thoughts about a blind highlight? Uh, not I can see you thinking about it. <laughs> Matt, what do you think about that? I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, so a blind highlight mode are, are within... John um, John asks, um, any plans to incorporate some kind of blind highlight mode for augmented? Uh, so you yeah. want to just yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. We are doing that through staging mode. Yep. So the oh, idea. I'm sorry. Staging, of course. And the idea behind staging mode in both live and blind is that it will respect both highlight and remdem. Next question. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a bit about um, color accuracy? in blind? How accurate will the colors be? How accurate is the colors rendering in, in augmented? So there's first off, there's no difference between live and blind. Um, so as you see it, um, really, um, if you see it live, you're going to see it the same way in blind. Um, you know, as we've looked at color over the last couple of years, we've done quite a bit to try and, and make sure that the accuracy that's represented inside of ES you know, reflects um, what is actually going on in the same world. We're going to use the same rules here. So if you use a generic profile, you're probably not going to see a huge amount of accuracy. If you use one of the more calibrated or specific profiles, uh, you'll see the same amount of accuracy that we should, we have throughout the rest of EOS. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned early on, there are a ridiculous amount of fixtures out there, and we can't touch every single one of them. Uh, so if you do see something that's a little weird, let us know, and we'll take a look at it. Um, but we'll we're trying to be as, as accurate with position and color information as possible. Yeah, and I'll add to that. Um, we did a, uh, a color tools webinar, uh, what was it, a week ago, five weeks ago, who can tell anyone? <laughs> um, but but uh, I, I was the presenter of that one, and we went into a lot of detail about how the EOS color engine thinks about color um, and how it represents color through things like the gel picker, the color picker space. Um, augmented is, is a part of that. Um, so I'd, I would encourage you to, to watch through that session, just sort of understand um, that 
there are always going to be discrepancies in the colors that are displayed uh, on the monitor versus what you're going to see in real life. Some of that has to do with our color engine. Some of that has to do with physics. Um, so study up there. Uh, and obviously, if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to email and we can clarify for you. This may be something you guys are going to cover throughout the rest of the series. Uh, when dropping fixtures onto a plot, is it easy to know direction, um, which way the whips are facing? Uh, I use whip direction and rigging to know how to rig them. Yes, uh, we actually just added a little green dot that is going to sit uh, with the fixtures inside of edit mode to show you where the rear of the fixture is, or the connectors of the fixtures. Oh. Lots of green dots. Just like that. Thank you very much, Rob. That was well timed. Sure. Perfect. <laughs> if I can come in and kind of spin around a fixture to make the point yep. here. Also, again, keep in mind every fixture is weird. If you see oddities, please let us know. We have a very, if you go to the forums, and we didn't actually talk about this maybe as much as we should, um, on the forums, we have a number of different pages um, which kind of guide you where you should be posting. So there is a general help and questions page. Um, and then there is a um, feature request section, and then there is a whole fixture and FPE section. So if you are seeing oddities with fixtures or using FPE, uh, please post it there as opposed to just in the general forums. Um, it's just a little bit based off of watching what, what uh, parts of the forum, so the people who are concentrating mostly on fixtures are staying away from the rest of the forums and just focusing on there. Uh, if you do post in the wrong place, don't worry about it. One of the, the uh, beta moderators will probably move it or actually where to place it. Uh, but if you can just help us out with that, it's just a, a organization thing that we're trying to be a little bit better about. Are you planning a session on um, magic sheets and augmented, using magic sheet as a starting point for augmented or using augmented to create your magic sheet? We will we'll touch on that in the in the upcoming uh, work through series. Um, I don't know that we have one planned for a whole session on that. Um, so we'll, we'll at least show the, the mechanics of it. Um, I would say maybe start with, with keeping an eye on that session. And if you've got more questions after, we could potentially do another one. Can you talk a little bit more about the green dot? Uh, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, are libraries updated to include the green dot? If not, can they do anything to add them? Um, are the green dots where the cable comes out, or is the green dot the front of the fixture? Matt, you want to jump on that? You've been a little bit more in, in that world than I have recently. Oh, we just lost Matt. Yeah, Matt's um, having some connectivity issues. I know a number of people are having, it seems like everybody's using WebEx right now. Um, yeah. We've been having a lot of drop-ins and drop-outs today. Let me just take a... I'll hop in really quickly about fixture yeah. profiles. Don't forget that the fixture profile, uh, as soon as you patch something, we copy that fixture profile out of our library and into your show file. So if there is an update, mm -hmm. if you're working in a show mm -hmm. file, um, if, if there is an update uh, to a fixture profile, you'll need to uh, go into patch and um, there's a, an area called fixtures, which gets you into your profile editor and you'll want to update uh, that fixture. We'll get a little asterisk next to it where Rob's showing you uh, that says that that fixture profile doesn't match what's in the current library. Uh, for now, when you're in beta and just playing around, no big deal, do this with errant disregard and you'll get the latest profile. If you're in production, you gotta be really careful about updating these fixture profiles um, because it can affect how you uh, interact with your fixture. So just be extra cautious. Um, in beta, it's easy to turn this stuff over very quickly to make sure that new things are showing up. Um, but be extra, extra cautious when you're doing this in production. Thank you. I think that covers the questions that we have. I'm not sure how much more time you guys want to spend in the session just, today. So th yeah, those are indeed the rear of the fixture. Uh, one, one last little thing there. Um, we are taking a look at some options to actually show X, Y, Z information as well uh, for direction to help with rotation, things like that. So you might see some changes to that in future builds. And I just noticed uh, in a recent build, we also added the asterisks out here in the main patch 
screen. So it's more, more apparent as soon as you're in patch that there's an update available for this fixture. Yeah, um, fair warning to everybody who's playing around right now in the, either the next build or the build after it, you're gonna see a, quite a bit of iconography change um, for information like uh, orientation of fixtures, uh, especially with the nesting uh, conversations. And this was stuff that we had put some placeholders in, we got some great feedback and now we're just finalizing it uh, as part of the beta process. So functionality isn't really changing. It's just going to be iconography to help you understand exactly what your fixture is doing, how it's nested, how it's facing. Uh, so probably going to see a little bit of uh Is that all for our questions, David? Sorry, yes. OK, great. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Matt, I'm sorry you were having connection issues. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks to everyone else on our panel. And I'll just end by uh, reminding everyone so what's coming in the in the upcoming weeks. So, and this will be every two weeks, beginning two weeks from today, which I believe is May 21st. Um, at this time slot, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time. Um, so we'll be going through. Uh, I'll be using the, our workbook as a as a rough outline. Uh, I'm not going to expect uh, folks tuning in to be able to follow along uh, like you might with our with our videos. Um, I, I don't think it'll be possible to do that with 100 or 200 of you um, in, in a live format anyway. But of course, we'll, our team will be here to answer questions as we're going through it. Um, they, they may be useful in uh, once it's recorded and posted to go through and kind of use it as a, as a tutorial. We'll see if you guys find that useful, let us know. Love to hear that feedback, um, but uh, I don't expect to you to, to follow along. So feel free to just sign in. Um, you will be able to download the Fashion Show show file. You can you can download it now um, if if you want to play with it before we dive into it two weeks from now. So that is what we have coming. I, I expect uh, well, it's going to be a little organic as far as how far we get each week. Um, I don't want to rush to get to a certain point in the book. We're just going to kind of go through, make sure we hit all the questions and we'll we'll get as far as we get. And two weeks after that, we'll pick up at that point. Um, so the descriptions will, I'll, I'll try to, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do my best to guess how far we'll get and put those in the descriptions, but know that it they might alter a little bit. So I look forward to seeing everybody in two weeks when we really all get to dive in and look at the, the details. Anything else from, from the panel? Question here, can anyone be in beta? Absolutely. Again, the, the really detailed how-to of how to get in there, sign up and download the software is in our Augmented for Educators video, which is on our YouTube uh, study, ETC study hall channel. There's also, There's also instructions in the Light Lab links that I posted in the Q&A earlier. I'm sorry, Anna, I interrupted you. No, 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 that's good to know. I didn't know that. And there's also uh, instructions on the regular EOS forum. So there's a sticky post. You, you do have to sign up. There's no vetting or approval or anything like that. So you guys have to worry. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, for being able to join us today. Uh, there's been some questions about when the schedule is going to get published. Typically, we're publishing the schedule um, either on Mondays or on Fridays for the coming week. So do check in to study hall regularly. Uh, but we will make sure that the schedule is out and you can plan on this being a regular time every other week to come and join us and learn some more about Augmented. Uh, thank you all for uh, Wait, wait, wait before we go, we should oh. promote Nick's pixel mapping session next next Monday, next two, Thursday. Wait, uh, what day? So Nick is doing uh, what you Next doing? Thursday. Nick, oh, I think so. Nick. No, oh, he's right there. He's he's oh. laughing. There he is. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was muted. Uh, yeah, it's next Thursday. Um, we're just going to be going through pixel mapping. Um, again, there are videos that are available for that, but it's a feature that we get a lot of questions on. Um, there were a couple of little revisions in 3.0, um, so I'll be using 3.0 to discuss that. Um, and it's really a forum to get some of your questions answered on uh, applications and functionality. Um, less than how to, but we'll start with a quick little how to for maybe the first 30, 35 minutes. Um, and then we'll kind of just dive into more open discussion um, about uh, ways to make pixel wrapping per. 
So uh, we'll see you next week for that one. Excellent. Uh, thank you all very much. I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording now. And uh, if there's any after hours questions, we can do it. Oh, my dog is joining the meeting. It's a perfect time to turn the recording off. <laughs>